This is Podkit, episode 14, Read the Read Me, on Sunday, November 29th, 2015. And now, the kit part of Podkit. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode also has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk14. Hello. Hey, everybody. Hey. It's been a while. Yeah. It has it been has. a while. We've got I a lot of stuff to talk about. Time. It's been like, what, four weeks-ish? Maybe? Yeah, about. But at least like we're being that. consistent with our four weeks, right? It's That's four right. four weeks or less. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of stuff to talk about as a result. Yeah. Um, first and foremost being this uh, post from GitHub about their new sort of style, which looks suspiciously like their old style, if I recall correctly. <laughs> Yeah, all this week I've been um, perusing various GitHub repos, and uh, I clicked on, do you want to try this new thing button? And I clicked it and was surprised to see no difference. Yeah, right? It's it's very, very similar. It just looks it just, more tabbed instead of looking slightly less tabbed, I guess. Well, it's, it's top tabs instead of side tabs. That's true. And it's, it's more of a uh, straight, you know... I don't want to say a vertical. It's a vertical design versus yeah. the, the, your standard sidebar and whatnot. I haven't tried this on mobile, actually. I should do that. So what do, what do you guys think about um, GitHub general viewing? Um, a lot of the times I use GitHub's repository search feature, mm-hmm. um, which lets me search for functions and variables and <laughs> documentation in a repo You know, mm-hmm. with, the, with that search box up on the top there. And I spend a lot of time on GitHub. Oh, totally, totally. Like for work, it's absolutely indispensable. A lot of the stuff that I do is kind of spelunking in really old code or spelunking in a lot of new code um, that's been written by other people. So um, it's great to have that repository search feature too. But the the things that I really like are the um, the way that the file browser works. Like that file oh, yeah. browser in and of itself is mm-hmm. like the best thing now on mobile do you do you find yourself looking at github on mobile a lot almost never i have an app called iOctocat that i use oh. instead i never thought of getting an app for github that's just crazy i See, have so, um or if you're going go by Brandon. no go for it um sometimes i'll see some project on twitter that i want to check out and i'm like oh cool i wonder what the code's like so i'll be on my phone because that's where i see a lot of twitter when i'm not on my computer um so then I'll go view code, and it's it's a little annoying to get to the view code section mm-hmm. on mobile, but when you get there, it works pretty well. Yeah. Um, I recently got, well, I'm I'm in test flight for one app that's also on the App Store, and another nice. app that is a Git app client for um, iOS, and that's been kind of fun to look around with. So if, if it's one of my projects, I'll have it on that app, which I haven't at the point needed to use yet, but it's there if I need to. Um, yeah, mobile is not great. Desktop is way faster. And I think it makes sense for GitHub to be so much better on desktop because most people are developing on a desktop. That's true. Uh, the only reason I, I, I wonder about GitHub mobile is when I have to click view read me, when I'm intentionally trying to view the read me. Right? Yeah, that's true. I wish they just showed it by default because... It's the that's why that's why I go to the landing page of a project to read the read me. Read the read me. Yep. Yeah. That's one of the things that I kind of like about iOctocat is that um, once you log in, so it is a GitHub client and not a Git client, which is a distinction that I did not fully understand when I first downloaded this, however many years ago. But um, it's really slick because once you locate a project, um, it's just it knows that that's what you're looking for. It's right there. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's other stuff that I like about it too. Like it handles my GitHub Enterprise account. So with the U. Oh, nice. How it's, so yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, you know, you can update issues from there, edit previous things. It's it's like, um, see, I, I, I'm hesitant to compare it to like one of those like third party Facebook account uh, clients that used to be out there. Um, and now isn't because Facebook stopped allowing them to do that sort of thing. Um, because like the thing, the thing that characterized third-party Facebook clients for me was how like crappy they were. And this is definitely not that it's quite, quite slick. Mm -hmm. Almost anything I can do on github.com I can do there, which is awesome. 
You mentioned Enterprise GitHub. I just want to say I like that University of Minnesota is on their used by thing on that page. Nice. I think I've mentioned that at one point before. Oh but yeah, yeah it's, it's, I like it's it. on the GitHub Enterprise page? Yeah. Nice. Because I remember when I first discovered that U of M had it, I'm like, what is this? I went to look about Enterprise GitHub and there was the University of Minnesota logo sitting on the that's, page. I think a few more people use it now than when I first saw it. But That's awesome. I know for us, I, I know like internally it was a, a bit of a struggle to um, to make that happen, but it's way cool that it did, and yeah, it's so awesome. I, I love it. If I didn't have it, UMN GitHub, yeah. I probably wouldn't use Git to work on new projects. Yeah, right, right. Because I, I can't, I, I mean, I need a private repo for, for school projects. I mean, I'm not going to have that outside, you know, public. So Totally. Yeah, mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, I know I could use Gitbucket. However, Gitbucket is down eighty percent of the time. Atlassian. Yeah, I it's, I feel bad for them, but you know what can I do about it? Yep, yep. But yeah, it it, it is really cool that we've got the GitHub Enterprise thing, and the the people who uh, who maintain it are are doing doing good work. So yeah, they definitely are. I, I appreciate that that effort. Yeah, it's I, cool. I'll it's I'll cool be that sad it to grow. lose it when I lose it. So sad. <laughs> Just, but, or just or work for the and you're fine. I just have to clone all those repos, I guess, and then push yeah, them right. somewhere else. Yep. yep. I'm a little curious to see how or what what will still work after I am graduated, but <laughs> still have an active account, and I'll see. Ah, yes. So, so here's, there's a lot that gets lost. Yeah. So here's the trick with that. I this is a little bit of inside baseball because I have to deal with this at, at work a lot. Um, so the GitHub Enterprise account is actually tied to Active Directory, which is why when you see that sign-in page, that's like sign-in via LDAP. What yep. it's actually doing is it's making a call to Active Directory to authenticate you. And when you graduate, you do lose your AD account. So then GitHub doesn't know you're a person anymore. And that's that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah, we'll have to clone that as well. Now, is there anything different between being a part-time and a full-time student? Uh, no, there isn't. All right, cool. Then I'm fine for next semester. Yeah, yeah. Are you only paying time next semester? Yeah, I'm taking five credits. Wow. And then you're done? Nice. Senior seminar and robotics. Very nice. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, I'm hoping it goes well. I'm what's like, what's the cutoff there for part time? Uh, six credits okay. is half time, I think. Yeah. So under six. Sweet, sweet. Well, that's cool. My earliest class is at 3 30 p.m. That <laughs> is. <laughs> the, that is that's like when my peak awakeness time so i would say that's perfect that's awesome i i hope i don't fall into a horrible routine where i sleep till one every day oh don't worry you'll be all and it's fine it's good for you no it's horrible because i stay up till four working on stuff and then i'm nocturnal uh, th- I, that's <laughs> the best time to work on stuff everybody leaves you alone it's dark out it's great <laughs> yep we'll see what happens i intend on at least waking up at nine twice a week we'll <laughs> okay. see what happens okay sure <laughs> so I think I put this next thing in here. Uh, this is a project, uh, incidentally, on GitHub. I think it's called Anti Moderate. I don't know why they called it that. Any uh, any ideas about that? I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, yeah, it, it seems to be sort of like a kind of sort of like a preprocessor kind of thing, so that you give it an image and it will uh, include the image like normal, you know, with an image tag in your HTML. But it will also en- generate a blurred out version in a kind of data URL inside of that image tag so that you kind of have a preview while the big image loads. So if you were yeah. trying to load a you know 500 KB image, you would get a preview of 1.7 KB instead while the big one's loading. Uh, and I think this is pretty cool. It, it's a really nice effect, too. It's blurred out gently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you, you know, it, you, you have enough definition to, to recognize the picture totally didn't just pop into existence. Yeah, Absolutely. I think it, it looks nice. It's like the, I don't know if you commented on this, the Facebook did a write-up about a yep. tool they use like this for their profile photos. Yeah, so mm-hmm. the, that, that's why I kind of thought this was a really interesting uh, thing. So Facebook, if you haven't heard, uses something called GraphQL. And I don't know how exactly GraphQL works. It's probably sort of like a NoSQL kind of system. It's kind of like keys and buckets based, I suppose. And 
it's not supposed to store a lot of big data. It's supposed to small s- store small strings, small numbers, you know, um, really necessary info, and then other info can be retrieved later. Well, they couldn't store a whole picture in the GraphQL server, so they decided to take a picture, like their profile picture or, or their header image, cover image. They trimmed it down from 70 KB to 200 bytes, and then took the headers and footers off that image data, card coded it into the app, and then prepend the payload to that stuff. And the, there's a blurred version. It, this is just so cool. It just it's amazing. It works. And man, Facebook. Right. And then, and then, I and then what? That. I think you posted a link to that yep. when that first came out, right? And I was impressed. Yeah, it was awesome. I think. Wait, was that in August? I feel like I was in an airport when I read that. Yeah, what is the, probably. Yeah, probably when I flew to, to Europe. Why would no, they have a date August. on their post? Yeah, it is August. I don't know. Yeah, Maybe don't know. it would have been there. But yeah, super cool. So Maybe like I, get some optimizations. I like mean, that. I think that kind of thing is really, really great. Um, I don't. I if you were going to build this technology into your website, so if if I were going to build it into, for example, the Nexus, I don't know why I would. I don't care if you see it fast although for somebody like facebook they want to make the experience as good as it can be for everybody who goes to to it um yeah this particular repo doesn't seem to have um like this seems to be all client side but i can see the big bigger value of it being a client and on the server side so that seems to be more like what facebook does because their their request is returned with some of the image where Because I, I imagine, you know, this would be good for very low bandwidth places, or exactly. if you're on GPRS or something. Well, even if even if, even not necessarily in low bandwidth, but just high latency. So you you know yeah. that the image is coming down, but you just don't know when the request will actually get fulfilled. For all those times you're in the in-flight Wi-Fi, or for yes, all those times yeah, exactly. you're you're. One uh, for all those times you're sitting in a place that totally should have UMN Wi-Fi but doesn't. <laughs> Like but the now, uh, or, Ackerman Twilight Zone, or 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 or, or, or uh, certain places in Keller, ironically. Yep. <laughs> That's yep. funny. But now you know where something like that would add 1.7 kilobytes for that example per to the page. So what if you have you know 20 or 30 images of that size? It's going to make your initial loading that much worse. It might. Oh, However, so normally you... it would load it without any images and then it would download the images and it gets it. But that has to take That's true. More However, time to download what it... if you were having a page with that many images, like 30 images is a lot on a page, you know, if we if we yeah. don't count like little um like uh type icons as images, if we if we're really talking about real images like pictures of things, yeah. um you probably do some kind of progressive loading anyway. So, um, in in this anti-moderate thing, there's the the, the JavaScript on the client side processes that um, anti-moderate base sixty four string of garbage, uh, presumably into an image. But I guess you could use one of those image loading scripts, hook it up to anti-moderate, so that as you scroll down the page, those images are progressively loaded in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's always an answer. I love the anti-moderate up. license, copyright 2015, do whatever, do whatever you, you want, want with it. Yeah. <laughs> Is, um, cool. There's, um, what's the license? It, let me try to look it up. Uh, it's um, the w, uh, WTFPL language uh, yes. license. Is that what you're talking about? I, I've heard. Well, that's not the license they use, but that's um, similar. Yep. I think it's kind of funny. Yep. Totally. So, uh, how about Foundation? Anybody use Foundation around here? Hey, yep. Yeah. I haven't used uh, F6 yeah, yet, too. but will soon. So, uh, this is uh, the first week of Foundation 6. Zerb has been making a big deal about the upcoming launch of Foundation 6. Yeah. Uh, they they have good reason to. However, there there has been sort of a bumpy rollout. Um, yeah. Apparently, now this is strange to me. Zurb is the company that makes Foundation, and they make it because they they also use Foundation in their client work. Mm-hmm. Well, people on their forums were asking, so how do you like? Okay, is there a tutorial about this? And basically, they said, 
you know what? We have a client that we're working on it with, and we'll turn their use case into the tutorial example. And yeah, when right. I read that, I'm like, you know, that's pretty fish suspicious. Yeah, right? Yeah. So they had no, like, examples of it. They had the, the documentation, but the documentation doesn't really show how it works all together. It's kind of sparse. Uh, so I was kind of weary uh, uh, about that. Or is that yeah, worry? Right. right. Yeah. So Foundation 6 offers a bunch of new things uh, and a bunch of the things that previous foundations have had. Uh, some notable things that I noticed was new flex grids. So yeah. that uses what flex flex box is that right? Yep, that's the one. Um, so this only, flex box only works on modern browsers. So watch out for that. But it's really cool. You can do some really cool things with it. Um, I personally haven't tried that yet. But as far as I can tell, switching to flex box is really easy. Uh, it, it uses all of the same rows and column class names, mm -hmm. so you don't have too much work to do. Definitely. Uh, let's see what else does it offer. It offers a simpler top bar markup, although when I was testing with it, it was still tedious as before. So I don't know about that. Yeah, I'd use the top bar in Foundation 5 a couple of times, but um, you're right. It's very tedious. Um, hopefully this one is at least slightly less tedious, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah, I tried. Uh, so I will get to the demo page that I made here in a minute, but my yeah. top bar has a two call or two row like title. So in my demo image example thing yeah. here, you can see the, the words e voting and then right under that group six. So it's kind of yeah. like two lines. And I also made e-voting bold in a bigger font. And I think the bar expects it to all be on one line. And yeah. the reason I think that is you can see the the one, two, three right next to it. That's aligned correctly in the middle there. But yeah. um, in the top bar documentation, they, they also show that you can have it uh, justified to the right instead of to the left, the links. Well, mm -hmm. if you do that, it won't be a middle aligned anymore. It just goes off to some crazy misalignment direction. Oh no. And I, I don't know what I have. I, I mean, I guess I can use, you know, relative positioning to fix it, but that's not, yeah, not automatic and not ideal. So I don't know what the deal with the top bar is. I've always struggled with it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What yeah. else do we have here? Uh, a big note is greatly reduced file size. It is literally m more than half, uh, half less than the previous version. That, that is great. awesome. And and that's not they, how do they do that? Um, I don't know how they did that, but I feel like they cut a lot of automatic generation off. So, uh, -huh. uh right now I'm not using the SAS version, so I don't know for sure. Uh, I tend to do mockups with the non SAS version so that I don't have to yeah. wait for it to compile every dang out time. Yep. Uh. But I, I think it has something to do with how they're not making styles for every little component now. They'll let they'll they'll let you turn it on in the SAS version if you want it. Nice. That's awesome. But I'm not sure if that's even true because I clicked on get the complete version, which I assumed had it all turned on. So maybe they're just not making as much garbage code. I don't know. That's cool. Less yeah, garbage code is good. Support too. Say that again? Do they have reduced browser support? So um, they drop IE8 or whatever? I don't know, to. because why would Zurb want me to know that? <laughs> you know, you, you, you would ask, hey, like, what's the difference between Zurb 5 and 6? Where's the, where's the you know, short document that tells me the differences? I don't know if there is one. Uh, according to my compatibility list here, uh, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Opera, Mobile Safari, and IE Mobile... The last two major versions are supported. Uh, IE 9 and up are supported, and versions 2.3 of Android and up are supported. Yep. That seems to be the same for version 5 as well. So, that's good. It just looks like the flex grid, perhaps, might be the thing that changed. Yeah, because in, yeah definitely. Yeah, because in, in version 5, it looks like the grid is fine with, uh, with all versions of all browsers well there's, that they there's two grids support. so there's there's normal grid and there's flex grid yeah so you'll always have the that choice 
Yeah, but FlexGrid doesn't have the uh, support for IE9. No. But I mean, that's that's like just IE9. Who uses IE9? I mean, anymore? if you're using IE9, you shouldn't be. <laughs> Pretty exactly. much. So that brings me to what I tried to use this for. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's always good to, you know, actually have something to test with. And it just so happens that in my um, computer science ethics class, we have to make a website for the final project. Nice. And I happen hey. to know how to make a website. <laughs> like, my, we got, in, you know, it's like a four person group project. And, you yeah. know, I got into my groups two, th- two Mondays ago and they told me, yeah, I don't know how to make a website. If if we need to do that, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you with that. And I'm like, eh, don't worry, I could take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, gotcha. Probably shouldn't have said it like that, but here we are. And so I I made you know a simple mock up with foundation, and mm-hmm. um you know it's 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 pretty cool. The grids work just the same. Everything works the same. There are some a few built in classes that are useful, like subheader and uh, lead and. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. default block quote uh, yeah, styles seem to be okay. So overall, mm-hmm. it seems fine. Um, the top bar threw me off. It still throws me off. I have no idea what to do with that thing. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I've, I have noticed in other usages of this, the form mm-hmm. styling that comes with Foundation is not as comprehensive as Bootstrap. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. I think um, I was running into something with um, was it was it date and time? I want to say it was like date time stuff that I was running into some issues with not too long ago. Um, and I think that's just always been the case mm-hmm. when you're using Foundation and not Bootstrap. But. Now that that being said, what you can almost literally do is open the Bootstrap file, copy out the form stuff, and paste it into your Foundation file. Yep. Uh, pretty much. That's pretty much what I did. I, I really, <laughs> I really like Bootstrap's form handling. It looks pretty. It, it looks nice. Um, and I don't know why Foundation doesn't put more emphasis on forms, but they don't. But that's okay. So I did it for them. Gotcha. Nice. So yeah, that that's Foundation six. They're already at version six point zero point three, I believe. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Uh, four. Four. Wow. In a day, that's changed. <laughs> so nice. uh, they're making headway on all their bugs. Uh, hopefully they get their documentation and stuff up to par. Uh, on the first day it launched, they had left a some, some kind of JavaScript include that was pointing to localhost still. Oh, no. <laughs> so they they fixed that since, but yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. So let's see. What else do we have here? Do we want to talk about APIs? I don't know. It's up to you guys. I don't know what sorts of APIs. Uh, yeah, let's let's do that next time. Okay, we'll do that <laughs> next time. Um, briefly, if you would like to know more about Matt's computer, uh, in all of its specs and glory, you can listen to the Fringe. However, if you would like to listen to the best story ever about a motherboard in Matt's new computer, continue listening now. I'm excited. So what happened? Uh, yeah. so what happened is on Monday this week. We went to Micro Center. Uh, this is, of course, the week of Thanksgiving. So, uh, you know, it, it's not busy. And, of course, everybody's preparing for their Black Friday deals. But Matt isn't one to care. Uh, so, eh. So we <laughs> go there and, you know, we pick up a motherboard. And uh, it's the Z170XP-SLI. It's a gigabyte board. It's really nice. Um Notable features about it is that it's a gigabyte board, and it has LEDs that dance to your music. Nice. So that's cool. Uh, and and we also get the processor motherboard combo at Micro Center, so yep. it's a little bit cheaper than if we bought it on Amazon or Newegg. Um, yeah. So nice. Nice. we we do that, and we bring the all the components back here, and uh, we hook it all up, and the system. Um, doesn't boot right up and we figured okay well maybe it's confused because we have the gpu and the onboard graphics on at the same time or something you know like the bios yeah. just didn't know which one to push video out to eventually yep. we get the um windows flash drive installer to boot in and boot up and start installing but then we get windows installed and what happens we get a freeze windows just freezes we weren't doing anything just freezes 
So then we're like, okay, fine, you know, no problem. You know, computers freeze for some reason. Fine, cool. Yeah. We restart. We just try it again. Windows continues going. Chrome opens. Freeze. So then we're like, okay, well, the memory must be seeded wrong or something, you know, like uh, a microscopic lint got in. No, no lint. It's perfectly fine. So then what? Mm. Well, so then we decide, okay, well, let's let's run MemTest just to see. MemTest runs perfectly fine for four hours. Oh, gosh. And then I decide to use Passmark's MemTest, which supports DDR4 memory, because this yeah. is the future. And yeah. this is impossible as far as I know, but MemTest freezes. So now... That doesn't, yeah, yeah. That doesn't even make any sense. No, it doesn't. Even if memory was bad, oh. MemTest cannot freeze. So then... What do I do? Well, I decided to start tinkering around with voltages and clock speeds in the BIOS because, you know, maybe something's just clocked a little too high by default. Maybe we just got bad memory. Maybe we got a bad processor and we just tone it down a few a few voltages and we should be good to go. Nope. And you know what's worse? The BIOS freezes. Oh, wow. How does the UFEI BIOS freeze? Well, I'll tell you. We got a bad motherboard. So on Friday, we went back to Micro Center to return our bad motherboard. And surprisingly, they did not, you know, perform any type of inquisition. They just said, yep, yeah, sounds like a bad board. Okay, here you go. Get it, Go get a new one. Okay, great. There you go. Have a good one. Did you get a deal because it was Black Friday? No, it was the same price that we paid. Okay. So that, that was fine. That That's actually almost preferable. So then we didn't have to yeah. swipe a card or do anything. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So... Yeah, uh, that was quite quite a thing. So that computer was so unstable, it would run perfectly fine for 35 minutes and suddenly just a freeze. There was no correlation oh, with anything. Um, it wasn't that the CPU was getting hot. It wasn't that the North Bridge was getting hot or the South Bridge. It wasn't that the GPU was getting hot. It wasn't, wasn't anything that was noticeable. Um, so that board was just bad somewhere. Oh, uh, gosh. Mm-hmm. And that's really the first time I've had to deal with such an egregiously bad board. Like, I've had unseated memory, I've had loose cables, but I've never had a board that was internally bad. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So you just well, ha- you yeah. just have to word- watch out for that kind of thing. Totally. And I, I mean, there are defects that happen from now on. Yeah. It's a good thing you got a new one without any extra money. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, and we, we were prepared to, um, like show them that it wouldn't boot we even brought our ddr4 sticks nice. so yeah so have have you guys ever had those kind of uh build issues no when i when i first built my uh, desktop i thought that it was gonna do something like that um i also had a gigabyte motherboard um, i think i'm still rocking ddr3 eight whole gigs of it um and i thought for sure that would have that would have broken some you know somehow i would have mess something up with the cable but sure enough first time i put it all in it all worked just fine which i was ecstatic about um but i the, the closest thing i had to that was when i uh, upgraded my graphics card a year ago so uh, up until that time i'd been using the uh, integrated amd graphics that came with my apu as they're calling it right yep the um the cpu gpu combo it's all on one chip okay. um and when i got the um when I got the graphics card, I put it in and it didn't boot. I was like, oh gosh, what's going on now? Right? Um, it turned out I just needed to do some finagling in the BIOS to turn off the Yeah. Um to turn off the uh the onboard. Mm-hmm. And it worked just fine. Worked just fine. So that was good. I I my my history with that's really just being paranoid about whether I broke something or not. Yeah. Not actually breaking anything. So <laughs> I mean, when we had that first board um, we didn't have Matt's new big fancy case yet. We were just using yeah. an old case that I had to temporarily mount it in so that we can install everything and then just test it while the new case was shipping. And yeah. we thought for sure that we were totally breaking the poor motherboard because, you know, to press down on those RAM dims, you know, you have to use quite yeah. a bit of force. And it and it looked so bad flexing there. And it's like, don't do it. <laughs> Oh gosh! Yeah, huh. but it all worked out in the end. So. Yeah, that is a great computer. You can listen to our rants and raves about it on our local fringe here. Um, nice. If anybody is in the market for a new computer anytime soon, um, 
and you live near a micro center, don't necessarily be swayed by the people online telling you that the 4790K is absolutely faster than the 6000 or 6700K. And while the clock speed may be higher, and that is true, unless you are doing something that is strictly single threaded, you might as well get the the newer 6700K because it is so fast and it's probably well, going to last for five years. In yeah. Starlink that Haswell doesn't have. Well, two that, generations. That 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 is true, but I don't know if that many people use those features. Yeah, it might be further optimizations later down the road than yeah. software. Can use. So I would strongly suggest for the thirty dollar difference, get the newer one. Yeah, totally. Noted. Mm-hmm. Um, I've I've had no issues with my I've built two computers, both Gigabyte motherboards, DDR three has well CPUs. Just that went fine. The only issue I've really have had is Macintosh related. So aside from that, it's all good. Except the only the only computer I've heard bad things about is when Ian uh, yeah started his motherboard. Mm-hmm. So Ian Buck, one of our listeners, uh, who's probably listening to this, in fact, hi Ian. Hi Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he uh, built his, I think he got an i5, but I can't remember for sure, uh, a few years ago. And uh, I th- don't remember what board he originally got, but it basically started smoking and burst into flames. And, oh, no. And, well, okay, maybe it, there was no flames, but it did smoke. I want to say he, it was Sandy Bridge CPUs that era. I want to say he tried mounting without the, uh, the mounting things that bring it up off the case i'm not sure i was talking to him oh. and sean the guy yeah. who also went to mars who yeah i it. don't know what exactly I happened but i i have i always assumed that it was just a defect with that particular board and basically the company who he bought the board from you know who whatever asus or asrock it was they said yeah we don't cover fire damage and i'm like huh yeah sure you don't so you yeah, gotta watch out for that yeah. Bad boards and fiery boards. Even though it's what twenty four volt, and it can still be enough to, yep, fry. All right, Black Friday was on Friday. Anyone get anything? Uh, well, before I go, what did you guys do? Uh, I bought an Apple TV and two four terabyte hard drives. Well, nice. that's pretty good. Building a NAS or something? That's awesome. Uh, a NAS out of my server, so that's nice. awesome. The features of a NAS minus the stability and ease <laughs> of a NAS. So yeah, really, what understood. am I doing? But yeah, I had two Seagate NAS hard drives for one nineteen each. That's awesome. I don't know if it was a Black Friday deal or not, but they were maybe twenty or thirty dollars cheaper than they'd ever been. Yeah, uh, that's I saw them on cool. Thursday in Europe time as well. So I don't know. Maybe it's Black Friday. I don't know. But yeah, that's nice. And then Target had a Apple TV deal for twenty five percent off. So about the sixty four gig model for about one hundred and sixty after tax. So very nice. That's way awesome. Super yeah. cool. Well, on Friday morning, I went over to Micro Center in St. Louis Park. Um, I was yeah, thinking about pick- yeah, right. I was thinking <laughs> about picking up uh, some sort of upgrades to my computer. But I walked right in and saw the uh, quadcopters that they had. They had a oh, row yeah. of quadcopters mm-hmm. as you walked in. <laughs> yep. And I was like, you know, I was going to upgrade my computer, but I think instead I'm going to get one of these. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I the, the first YouTube link in the show notes is a link to the actual quadcopter I got, um, which is uh, called the Hubson uh, FPV. It's, it is so crazy that is pretty Um, cool it's like uh so do you just hook your phone up to it and while it's recording video and let it fly around no there's there's no no phone involved with it in fact i think i i suspect that the controller for it is actually running embedded windows oh wow that's great i could be wrong your drone's Uh, gonna get hacked yeah it's it is hilarious um it's awesome it's about the size a little bit larger than so this the central unit is about the size of a mouse um uh, the the computer kind, not the living kind. Yes. Um, possibly the living kind too. But anywho, um, the the quadcopter itself is probably about you know a little bit larger than uh, you know one of the blue snowball microphones. Yep. It flies really high, really quick. That's great. It is. 
it's remarkable. This is the first quadcopter I've ever owned, and it's by far like the most stable flying thing that I've ever seen, other than an actual airplane. Right. Um, this, those are the same stable. version, or I just see there are a couple different. I'm looking online trying to find some specs. Yeah, I think I think it's the D version. I could be wrong. Um, okay. It's it's pretty slick. It's pretty slick. Uh, so the what's the controller take, like? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the controller actually has a display inside of it. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Because I remember seeing, you know, the the early drone helicopter controllers and their insanity of designs and buttons and things to do with. That's why I was never yeah, right? too interested. So I put an Amazon link in the show notes right now that has the quadcopters controller inside of it. Amazon needs to learn how to make nice links. Come on now. I, right, I have to right. share and then I copy the little shortened email link. But oh. That's too many I, wonder, steps. I wonder if I have the the share on here this controller looks pretty cool yeah it looks it's, clunky it's, but it looks awesome with his screen right i was surprised at how um how uh pretty darn all right it was to use right you just got the trim uh the trim levers yeah uh, and that's just fine and they match pretty well with the on-screen uh display of how the controllers are set right so it, it gives you a sort of indicator of how far off from level you are any any of the in any of the directions um it's pretty darn easy to control uh the battery lasts for a whopping 10 minutes and then takes an hour to charge on the drone or the remote for the drone the the remote itself takes uh double a's which it burns through uh quicker than quicker than uh paper on a dry thing that you light on fire i don't know that was that was gonna be a metaphor yeah (laughs) Quick, quicker than paper on a dry thing um but it, it's really slick it's really slick and it um it's amazing the kind of weird stuff you can get us to do i'm still really bad at flying it but um I'm, I'm excited to take it outside possibly later today and see what happens when it actually interacts with the environment but it's yeah that, cool. is, that is pretty cool i i've never flown one so that's that that'd be fun to see yeah, it's it's kind of strange because the so the left joystick um, will control which way it's pointing, right? So mm-hmm. left, right, f- forward, or backward, um, or I guess which way it leans, um, mm-hmm. because a quadcopter needs to like needs to tip in order for it to actually change direction. Yeah, and then the other stick controls whether whether the force is pushed left, right, up, like. Um, up in height or down in height which is that thing is just ridiculous so Oy. when you when you're controlling it and you let go does it just stay where you put it no when you let go it uh, shoots up to the ceiling <laughs> what oh it, wait there's a spring so it shoots up like on so or? so when the controller itself is pointing to what you would think would be equilibrium it's actually not really equilibrium. So it's like it my mixer. It still has enough force to go up. Yeah, huh. pretty much. <laughs> it is ludicrous. In order to get it to, to you know, so to kill to, to kill it, to, to turn off the engines or whatever, um, you have to hold the stick all the way down. And in order to get it to hover, it's kind of like a weird balance of somewhere between zero and one kind of there, right? Huh. Yeah. It's, it's ludicrous. Because I, I have a little mini, like, I bought it for $35, a drone, mm-hmm. and I bought it on Black Friday a year ago, actually. Mm-hmm. One of those impulse things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Similar to how yours sounds. And it's maybe, I don't know, three inches, a square kind of thing, so it's pretty small. Yeah. But this, my remote is, I think it also runs on batteries, the AAA or something. But no no screens, no camera, mine is tiny. But there's one for going, you know, forward, back, left, or right, and then there's one for going up and down in height. Yeah. But there's no spring in there. So you just, I, I don't think, so I think you can just let go and it will stay. Maybe it might drop down though. It might actually just shut off the, I don't even remember. But the, on the, the height one, you can also twist. You have to like grab the top of the knob and twist it and then it will change which orientation is pointing. Nice. Oh, that's so cool. That is so cool. We should, we should cool. fly our drone sometime. Yeah, when that'd we, be awesome. When we get reunited when I come back. Definitely. Yeah, that'd be way cool. And uh, in winter, I'm- if they crash, you know, the snow's soft. Yeah, yep. it'll, it'll just go into the snow and disappear because it'll because it's all yeah and then plastic. 
all the motors will be really hot, so it'll just melt water. Oh, great. Just, just wonderful. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But the, the only other thing I have to say about this uh, thing is that you can record flight with it. So there's a little SD card you can put in the controller. So you oh, can awesome. actually use the video afterwards. It's just a really weird resolution that you then have to upconvert somehow, probably using FFmpeg. Yeah, um, could be worse. So, At least you get video. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. It is. It is, do, so is it HD or is it SD or it's worse SD, than SD at best? Slightly worse okay. than SD, probably. But it is so cool. It is just so crazy to see the um, the thing you're flying from its perspective. It's just like so weird. Like, well, yeah. you just have to watch out for the FF, FFA now. Well, aren't there rules yeah. in December or January? Well, I think they're still working on them, but yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. I would like um, to get a drone that is larger than the tiny kind that I have that has a little camera on it too. That'd be so much fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. So the, the next step for that, of course, is my third YouTube link here, which is the Phantom 3. Oh. Have you guys heard of the oh, Phantom 3? Yeah. 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 I, Nothing... This is the big one, yep. That's that's the one, you know, at the, at the very least, it'll run you $600. It's so slick looking, but... You know, when you think fly, about it, $600 for that kind of thing isn't that bad. It's not bad at all. Because it's, it's an iPad, basically. No, totally, totally. But the trick is, you can that thing you can fly out of out of uh, out of view. I can't fly mine out of view. Right. It, at best, it gets a hundred feet away, which is fine. It's awesome, but you just can't. Yeah. Yeah. Watching know. watching the video is pretty cool too. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but the Phantom Three, like that sort of thing, I feel like I need a license to to fly that because it it can go something like five kilometers. Oh, uh, how heavy uh, is it? Away from you, uh, just just a uh, a couple pounds, I think. It, it's not that heavy. Because I, uh, I, I I remember one hundred eighty grams. Yeah, but, um, because I'm not in the US, so that's right. Mm. I remember reading something about weight limits being the primary difference. It has GPS. Um, its max ascent speed is five meters per second. Its max descent speed is three. Max speed of sixteen meters per second, and no wind. Yeah, I, 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 I saw it going. That somebody had a demo where they had it going like almost twenty meters per second. They were pushing it past what the stated max geez. was. It can record in HD if you have the professional version, and the advanced you can do two point seven K. That's awesome. Yeah, it is so so cool. I'm gonna try to find this. Um, I saw somebody with a uh, take the Phantom out for uh like the long range test, and mm-hmm. they they almost lost it. They had to park it, to park it somewhere. They were flying it over a river for so long, and they're like, "Oh crap, I don't know where it is, and I, I don't know where I can land it because there's just a river around me." <laughs> and they were running down, running it down to like the last few battery, uh, you know, last few volts. Yeah. It lasts 23 minutes. Is it's flight time about um the phantom 3 professional has a 100 watt battery the advanced only has a 57 mm. it's an interesting huge difference yeah definitely yeah I, I just put a link into the um drone task force proposal rules this is a link from npr and mm. uh there they aren't rules yet uh apparently you don't register each drone which is silly you register yourself and <laughs> That's not my, that was not my understanding of it originally. Um, there's if it's below 0. 0.55 pounds, I think that's 250 grams. Um, it doesn't matter. But if it's between that and 55 pounds, you have to register. Where you only need to put your name and where you live to get your identification mm-hmm. number, which you only have to write on your drone, and your name and address are only recommended requirements. But you really don't even have to put in an address. <laughs> nice. So it's just a way to potentially identify the owner to a drone. I think so, but I feel like, oh, my drone caught on fire as it crashed through your house. Too bad you can't read the number. Uh, I feel like that's going to happen a lot. Yeah. And unless, I mean, they're not going to have random people going, oh, I see a drone. Let's go find the owner, flag it down, and make sure they have it on there. I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. though. Yeah, that's I mean, true. if it's in a big park with a lot of people, I'm sure that they might, but only if it's a concern. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it is cool that the they intend to make it free for that that first class of registration, but I feel like it needs to be a little bit more sophisticated than that. I don't know. Definitely. Yeah, it's it's enough now to not really be much of a problem at all. Like, I was a little worried. You know, you're gonna have to pay money to get a license to 
fly a drone, maybe some training. I don't know. I don't know if the training thing, I don't know. I don't think we have the infrastructure in place yet to do that. No, either. Yeah, and what, but, are they capped at 500 feet? Or? Uh, it says keep under five, stay away five miles from an airport, avoid flying nearing crowded stadiums or crowded places otherwise. Um, and keep it uh, in line of sight and below 400 feet. Although that's silly to me because the whole point of it's that you, yeah, don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if nobody catches you, it's okay. So just don't get caught, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. If if, if you, well, if you own the land, that's, uh, I don't know know, if that, I don't know. I don't know if that even counts though. Cause you don't own up. You only own the land. But if, well, that's true. That's true. But if you only, if you keep it within, you know, the first, uh, if you keep it within 100 feet and on your own land, then there's almost no likelihood that anyone else will see it. True. Now you just just need to own some land first. (laughs) Yeah, right? Yeah. But drones, they're fun. That is pretty cool. That is is pretty great. Uh, Have you guys seen the uh, South Park episode from last season about drones? Yeah, I'm not a South Park watcher. (laughs) I'm not. I had a roommate who did, so I would see some episodes, but it's quite entertaining if you ever get around to it. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see. There's some other kind of fun stuff that I've been doing ever so since. Diving Friday. into old versions of OS ten, huh? That's oh, not even OS ten. I, I if it were just OS ten, that would be one thing. Oh no. So um I've got a bunch of videos that um my family wants to convert from D V tapes up to anything that's not D V tapes so they can actually like watch these. Yeah. So um, like the yeah. little the little things you put in old camcorders, right? Yep, exactly. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found out pretty recently that I don't have any computer really uh, that can read those from you know from a camera. I don't have any computer with FireWire um, that that I that I use on a daily basis. So I went into my parents' basement and started spelunking for old computers. I first found an old Sony VAIO that I was thinking might work because the VAIO, Sony, of course, was one of the people who did the, the IEEE 1394 right. standard or whatever, which is also known as FireWire. Mm-hmm. Um, but I couldn't get Linux running on it because there were no drivers. Yeah, because Sony. Uh, oh, and I couldn't install I couldn't install any, uh, any software on it because um, the Wi-Fi chip that I was using, which I got at Micro Center the day before um, for a, a ridiculously inexpensive, like, $4.00. Nice. Um, so that's like, uh, there were no drivers for that either because no, it was too new. Yeah. So I couldn't even get the the Debian net install image to recognize it, which is sad. Um, so when I moved on to the PowerBook, the PowerBook needed to have Tiger installed on it because whatever version of macOS was on it didn't have iMovie bundled with it. So I installed Tiger only to find that Tiger doesn't have iMovie bundled with it either. No oh, man. So this is when I had to go down to. Cl- truly classic Mac OS, OS 9. Oh. Um, brought out the old Flower Power iMac, and now I'm pulling videos off it that way. It's awesome. It's so cool. So much fun. But at some point, uh, I think Brian and I are going to have to do Brian and Brandon review old versions of Mac OS. Hey, you know, we have a new show just that for that purpose. I would love we to review. Do. We just try and, I think between our computers, we could install every version of Mac OS from 9 and on. I think we can. So you're going to, you know, together write the next Syracusean review? Yeah, we'll just redo all the Syracusean reviews, all of it. <laughs> In audio form. Right. You know, I think I have I, I think I have something running System 7 too. I don't know if I I don't know oh, if it's man. capable of doing System 8, but I think we can do System 7. That's My crazy. uh Macintosh SE30 is running System 6, but it has a bad capacitor. So maybe oh, we can no. look into that and try and fix it too if you want. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> awesome. Okay. Or I or I sell it and get rid of it because otherwise it's doing nothing for me. Because I want it to. Yeah, I gotcha. But hey, Ryan, what's that other show you were talking about? Well, you know, we if if we ever have anything to review for some strange reason on any show, and we, you know we want to make a dedicated show about it, we actually have a new show on the network. Uh, this has been led by Ian Buck, which is why I refer to it as his show, although it's for anyone to use, and that would be Second Opinion. And uh, let's see, I think I have a link here. We uh, actually talked about something already previously on Second Opinion, and uh, that was Android 6.0 Marshmallow. So that was a a pretty pretty exciting first episode. Now, 
pretty much any show I'm on turns into basically the same show. And uh, I do apologize for that. So basically every show I'm on is ATN, just under a different name. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, um, although uh, there was a great, great show, uh, the the series, hopefully we'll get some more episodes coming up here. Um, I don't know what uh, Ian has in store for reviews. Uh, if you haven't heard, Ian used to do uh, 8-Bit with Ian Decker, but since that show is no longer going on, that used to be a news-based show, this gives them the opportunity, in addition to reviewing you know gadgets and stuff, to also review games that they play or, you know, other things they try. Uh, you know, and it gives anybody on the network a place to put a dedicated singular topic review. Nice. And uh, yeah, Brandon awesome. actually worked on the uh, album art on this particular uh, it is series. Album art. And really uh, like there you go. It's great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I learned a lot about, uh, about Adobe's licensing practices. <laughs> and the, how the awful process. they are. Um. Yep, 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 yep. But it's it's good. It's got some good stuff. It's always fun to work on uh, podcast art with you guys. Album art is pretty awesome. So I'm glad you guys like it. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it's simple and it has all those little icons that we all like. Yeah, yeah, rocking the font, awesome. And and of course, uh, if you see the album art on the website from the link there, you can also look at the alternative album art the square album art which looks slightly different uh if you download the episode and look at the mp3 album art itself um Mm -hmm. one day we'll we'll have a new cms (laughs) and um it will all be uniform but until then you can have fun easter eggs yeah that's true that's true indeed yeah that it's it's kind of funny because i did a similar thing with podcast yep uh with the podcast album art man the podcast album art is beautiful yeah. Oh, thanks. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. You guys had a good idea for to to do that long shadow sort of thing. Long yeah. shadows are. Yeah. It, it adds just enough over there to make it look interesting. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It's cool stuff. Well, I have one more thing to talk about. And okay. That is um, kind of the one of the things that we had talked about originally when we were first planning a show called Podkit, and this is the part where I start actually doing the kit part of PodKit, Ooh. which is, Ooh. yeah, right? So we're we're talking about um, actually building an iOS app. Um, right now, it's just an Xcode playground, but at some point, who knows? It might be something interesting. Uh, and that is a JavaScript interpreter for iOS. Oh. Yeah. I probably shouldn't say too much, too many words about this right now because I don't actually have most of it thought out. But I made a little pr- playground a couple days ago, uh, a little Xcode playground, where basically I take in text as input, pass it to JavaScript core, have it evaluated, and push the return value back, because that's kind of sort of what a what an interpreter does. Pretty much. Basically, sort of. Well, that's that's what the the UI for an interpreter does. Uh, all the interpreting is really being done by JavaScript core. It seems pretty basic and pretty simple, so I'm going to give it a go. Uh, not right now, because I have to squash a lot of 20, uh, 2021 homework between now and then. But at least um, the 2021 homework will help you write your interpreter. Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? Gosh. Yeah, it reminds me. Oh, I, I, yeah. It is It is pretty darn cool. So I used this, uh, this article that I linked to in the show notes um, that describes some of the ways that you can interact with stuff like uh, JavaScript core. Basically, you just spawn a context pass the function to the context and then now are you doing uh, it in this awful syntax called objective c or are you using swift aha uh-huh. yeah i was just about to get there uh, i am using swift yay so it all looks very strange when you look at the objective c version but almost all the methods are exactly the same i hate objective c it is the, the <laughs> worst syntax i can imagine yeah it is it is something else it is something else it's like the the weird uh the weird combination of like uh what do they call it polish notation the one where it's like uh post fix operators and uh, uh sure uh, yeah something like that a reverse polish notation the i don't know one that, that microsoft dude came up with all lisp like and uh and uh stuff like that you know i'm, it's, I'm it's really a cool. big fan of weird languages but objective c is it's too much like c and not enough like sensible <laughs> <Objective. laughs> it's subjective 
Would you say that Objective C is objectively bad? Yeah, uh, subjectively uh, bad. Maybe? Nah, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, it turns out that that wasn't my one last thing. I have one last, one last thing. Wow, that's even uh, that's one the, more thing. That's yeah, that, that. even better for Apple. Yeah, right, right. Um, and that is that is that um, my network problems have been pretty well chronicled on uh, previous episodes, as you all know. And in this case, um, just this past weekend, uh, so the the weekend before Thanksgiving, uh, we ended up getting a new Wi-Fi router, which is way cool and helped assuage most of the issues we were having related to the Apple TV stuff that we spoke about in the last episode. Um, so all of a sudden Netflix is really reliable. Airplay is ridiculously reliable. Um, and life is good on that front. We've got both of the Apple TVs hooked up. Oh, so by the way, the cool thing about this new router is that it has dedicated SSIDs running on 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. Um, and it's pretty freaking awesome. And what router Uh, did you get? Ah, that's right. I got the wire cutter recommended Netgear R 6,400. That's the one. That's the one right there. Oh, there it is. We found it. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is quite physical antennas, the best. Oh, great! And it's eight eight hundred two on AC. Good. You bet. You bet. It is it's... so slick. Even my old Apple TV, even the second gen Apple TV, will connect to the five gigahertz network, which just made me smile. That is great. Wait, the second right? gen has five gigahertz. Yep. Oh wow! I guess it is two thousand. 10. 20, yeah, twenty ten, something around there. It was it was surprising that it that it worked and it was awesome that it did. I was kind of freaking out. It has um, onboard so got, storage, 120 megs of flash and 100, 256 of RAM, that's great. Yep. You'll never yeah. have a nice. buffer to uh be full. Yep, that's the hope. That's the hope. So the five gigahertz network is now specifically for the Apple TVs, and the two point four gigahertz SSID is particularly for everything else. So w- when you have your networks at home, do you name them the same or do you name them differently? Oh, no, we name them differently. Okay. <laughs> we name them differently. And one of them is named after an old uh, game show. And then our Apple TV one is just named like Cupertino Spaceship or something. Oh, okay. That's cool. <laughs> uh, so here yeah. we, uh, or, well, I guess it's not we, it's mostly just me. Uh, yeah. I name my um, networks after mathematical things. So previously, nice. years and years ago, uh, it used to be derivative and integral. Nice. Two point four was derivative, and integral was five, and nice. now I'm on pi and tau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yep. right. So yeah. that's that's my theme. That's awesome. So I also I've put a. By, uh, oh yeah, you Mitchell, go. My last name is the name of the network. Uh, although my parents' house it switches around every so often. I think, um, actually, yeah, I changed it over the summer because there was some issue and. I just was like, screw it. I'm going to reset the router and start over from scratch. And I named it. Um, so next door, someone has their network called uh, Por Que Fi. So mm-hmm. Y in Spanish. Oh, yeah. nice. Wi-Fi. So nice. I, I did the Danish equivalent and did uh, Vafo Wow. Which is Wi-Fi. That's great. Did you, did you intentionally put in it like a Unicode character to screw up clients? No, that word has no Unicode character. Oh, that's too bad. Because that, that would break something. Although my previous network did have a Unicode character and some versions of Windows would not render it properly. So that was always fun. Or like my Nintendo 3DS wouldn't do it right. But any good Apple device is just fine with it. I, I put in a link here to um, UBNT and mm-hmm. um, uh, Max, uh, Brian's friend, um, put a tweet out months ago about getting a some kind of a router from them. And mm-hmm. uh, since then, I've been looking at them pretty strongly for future purchases of routing and Wi-Fi needs. Um, so oh, these totally. these are prosumer, like semi-enterprise um, products. And like the biggest thing for me would be that control panel, which I can actually see something useful in, but also totally. having the reliability of APs that are really super duper great. Definitely. So I used... Um... Equipment from Ubuntu. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Ubiquity is the real Ubiquity. name. But yeah. yeah. Um, when I had my job two summers ago at a wireless internet service provider, and mm-hmm. their stuff seemed pretty nice. I had, I've seen some things online, and this seems to be you know a little more of a gimmicky company when it comes to professional wireless equipment, but it's probably way more full featured than a lot of the consumer stuff will find. That's pretty much what I'm looking for. 
Just I want yeah. I want an operating panel that I can actually do something in. So Definitely. for example, when I have my router, which is uh one of those dark night routers from a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Whenever I reset it, you know, power goes out or, you know, just freaks out and turn the power off and turn it back on. It loses the number of gigabytes we've consumed in the house. Oh no. It doesn't remember anymore. And it's like, really now? And so I'm hoping one of these kind of things could, you know, help me live. So the so in my parents' house, where I live when I'm not at school or studying abroad, um, we have the 2008 Apple Airport Extreme Wireless N, um, and then we so that's just in bridge mode to make the network and act as a switch. Our router is your wonderful 2009 Quest. Nice. Uh, DS Q1000. Uh, it's I tell I think Q100. Yeah. Oh, nice. So it's got a nice 64 megabytes of RAM, and it is horrible. And I think something's broken in it because I can't forward certain ports anymore because it thinks they're in use, but they're not, including, you know, like port 22 or 5900. But, oh, well. I'm, yeah. I've been pushing slowly to get a new router to my parents. And especially yeah, right? we've had internet issues over the years, and I think just a new router would be fun. But it's just we're stuck in a DSL, so I don't know. I have I at one point did have it do the... PPP over Ethernet on the airport, but it something got messed up two months into it, and I had to re- do everything, and it wasn't quite. Yeah, totally. We were rocking the um, airport extreme from two thousand seven uh, for the longest time, so uh, I definitely get those feels there. <laughs> yeah, so, so that might be something I try. So, how do you have yours set up, Brandon? Do you have DSL still, or do you? No, so in 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 oh seven we switched over to Comcast and Ooh. we've been running with cable internet ever since. Uh, so we moved straight from AOL to Comcast. Okay, yeah. never never <laughs> mind my farmer must, boo. It's okay, it's fine. You, yeah, you right. must have a a cable router then, right? Or a, a cable, cable modem, yeah. Yep, uh, so standard support sort of thing. Do you, have it, do you have a double network, two layers deep, or do you have it in bridge mode? Your modem or our, our modem is in bridge mode, so. Uh, it's used to passing whatever traffic straight to the router. It just matters what routes on the other end. So. Okay, that's nice. So do you do all the authentication stuff on your new router? Yeah. Okay. Yep, that is correct. Yeah, I How should really put it? mine into bridge mode too, but I don't. How easy is it to do that in Comcast? Because I know when I did it with Quest, maybe it was before CenturyLink bought them. I'm not sure. I don't remember. The The person on chat was really questioning my desire to to get the username and password for the account so I could do the actual authentication. Oh, uh-huh. so do you mean for the PPOE thing? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, you should have well, for... you should have that just naturally. And, like, I don't think you can even connect to their network without that. Yeah, but on my DSL modem, it's all dots, and you can't ever, you can't get the text out of it. You have to contact support to get Yeah, but how did you set that up in the first place, then? Uh, it auto finds it. Based Does it on really? Your phone number or something. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, when I got so. when I got um, when we when we switched from whatever we had to or we we had Visi, and then we switched just to CenturyLink to save ten dollars. Um, they they just gave us those codes, the username and password, so that we could log into their network. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like because it's a it's a CenturyLink request router or sorry modem. And it's tied to the phone line, so they have they can find yeah, what our phone number is. That makes it's sense. Auto set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for for my experience with Comcast, has been a little bit different. Our router is or our modem is so um, it's the most basic that um, Aris or whatever it's called uh, makes. Uh, so it doesn't actually have any sort of like Wi-Fi um, capability on board, mm-hmm. or really any sort of routing capability to speak of at all. Um, so there's literally just the one Ethernet out, and I can from there that just hooks straight into some other piece of hardware, um, which it turns out needs to be more than a switch because it's of course in bridge mode. Um, when I was when I was testing it out, I, I realized later that what was happening was um, so originally I wanted to keep the Airport Extreme and this new router running in parallel because uh, I have a five port switch that I was going to hook up between them, but the router of course was in or the modem of course was in bridge mode so there was nothing to assign any sort of ip addresses yeah. um <laughs> which is bad so instead once we plugged in of course the one router then it was just fine 
but yeah. Comcast doesn't really have, surprisingly, doesn't have that many hoops to jump through on that end, so long as you have a really basic router. I think there's like a bigger one that you can get that has Wi-Fi built in, but once you do that, then you start serving that Xp- Xfinity Wi-Fi network to oh, everybody man, else in the neighborhood. Oh, man, that's awful. Yeah, which I am not behind, so. No, no, don't do that. Yep, but it's fun stuff. Wi-Fi is fun. As I said, like, Swapping out the router has made a world of difference for the stability of the network, so it's pretty cool. So I had we had some uh, Twitter followers. That's true. That's true. I've got three in particular that I'm really excited about. Um, the first one is Inquisitive Software, um, which is this one guy Harry who is making an iPhone app called or an iPad app called Simul, which is a Markdown uh, text editor, and it is so cool. It is way awesome i uh bought it on the recommendation of brett terpstra uh who is a um a developer and tech who can't pundit, sleep uh, who can't sleep yeah he's from overtired uh, <laughs> which is one of my favorite non-nexus podcasts um and uh Simul is just really slick i had a quick question for the developer about something and i was amazed that he responded in like 30 minutes and he's he's in london wow. london very nice and I, uh, I, I emailed him about that, or I, I guess that's not entirely fair. I don't know if he's in London. He's in the UK, um, but he's he's on London time, I guess, in in my estimation. <laughs> um, and I was just freaking out because he's a really cool guy. Responded pretty immediately to that request, and um, he's doing some cool stuff with Simul. So if you haven't checked that out yet, it's definitely good to check out. Um, next up is Steam Clock Software. They had a post uh, out this week. Uh, Alan Pike particularly about how um, their uh, somebody was using their email address as support for their fake and oh, really horrible I saw this, yeah. iPhone apps. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating story, and it, it ended up working out just fine. Uh, it's really cool that it um, that it did get sorted out. But uh, they're a good follow, anyhow. Anywho, but um, and then finally is uh, Ryan Mudrick, who is a UX designer. Um, and UX developer who is really kind of cool, uh, tweeting about uh, a bunch of different things, including documentation, uh, stuff like that. He's he's a pretty infrequent tweeter too, which is nice. Um, but kind of some cool cool stuff if you look back. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, I haven't really followed many people. Um, I am following Peter Steinberger, who's a PS PDF kit developer. Um, Otherwise, that's about it. I will say I did fo- I do follow now Brian Mueller, who's we kind of talked about this, who's the developer of the Carrot apps. Yeah, nice. yeah, he's cool. Yep. I've actually now I follow him, the developer, rather than just the account for the apps. Yeah, that's nice. about all for me though. How about you, Ryan? Anyone new? Uh, I don't follow that many people frequently. I keep my tweet stream pretty <laughs> low key. Gotcha. You can borrow a couple of mine then. I, <laughs> we're, I, I we're might no have to. Brandon's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm at 263 people I follow on my tech account, and it's a bit much sometimes. And I'm always looking out for people who I'm like, eh, I don't need to follow you anymore. Right. Which I feel yeah. a little bad about, but at the same time, I'd rather follow only a group of people I care about now. I am at a pretty remarkable 1,555 people oh. I'm following. Um, and I've got a, a whopping 813 followers too. So <laughs> I, mean, I I feel like I might have followed more people in the past, back when the Verge was really good. I used to yeah. follow it, all of the individual personalities there, but since then I've completely blocked Reckless among other people, and um, you know I, I have removed a few of the um, other Verge people. Um, you know my um, technological inclinations come and go as far as the tech media that I decide to watch yeah. gotcha gotcha say i did just track down a bonus uh follow for this week who is really awesome her name is aline and she does a lot of word sayings and podcastings about um diversity in tech among other things um she had some pretty darn cool uh writings about uh the ipad pro recently she runs with kind of the imr crowd at times so um, definitely an awesome follow and her podcast less than or equal is pretty darn cool too cool nice yeah so I, th- I think i think that might be just about it and we're doing pretty good on time too yep so what do you think 
should we call it? What are we going to do next week? Uh, next week I have a few midterms. I have paper, you know, school stuff. Pretty exciting. Yeah, same uh, here. Yeah, you finish. No, sorry. I'm uh, I'm tidying up uh, the architecture lab for 2221. Nice. 2021. 2221 is a building. 2021 is the class. Um, that's that's basically what tonight's going to be. Uh, and then in the future, I'm going to be working on a couple of different things. Uh, that iPhone app I was discussing, that iPhone slash iPad app. And uh, I'm still having some fun over in uh, Backbone JS land, uh, right. where I most recently uh, figured out a way to make a mock API uh, for a somewhat realistic CMS sort of thing. Um, and, and that's been kind of fun. Uh, those are the main things for me. How about you, Brian? Uh, I have a final in sustainability at 8.30 tomorrow morning, so that's less than 12 hours for me right now. Um, still have to study. Uh, I have basically my finals. Danish language and culture written test on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, I have a paper for 20th century European history due on Friday, and I'm working wow. on a big artificial intelligence project. Same one as I have for the last month and a half or whatever. We finally nice. got an alpha beta search working, so that was really fun. That's um, good. And then I'm going to this concert for this Danish band that I don't really know anything about on Thursday, and <laughs> I'm cooking for the Danes in my kitchen on Friday. And then, nice. Uh, more project work the weekend. I don't know. Yeah. Nice. And then my actual finals week is pretty empty, so we'll see what I do then. Very nice. That's good. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Well, where can we find you on the internet, Brian? Uh, you can find me just about anywhere, but especially on the Twitters. I think I maybe messed that up at uh, bman4789 or at tech4789. And you can hear me talk about my week, I guess. Nice. Or my website, brianm.me, that needs to be redone, which will be done at some point. Well, another fun thing for Brian to do is um, to follow his weather accounts because oh, when right. he's traveling yeah. anywhere, the weather is very likely to be unknown or in some air state. <laughs> that is another thing on my list that needs to be fixed. Uh, I think it was uh, a week or two ago. Um, mm -hmm. All the time it would be the weather is not available. And so it'd be that picture of Dr. Evil yep. from Austin Powers. And after a while, I just started deleting the tweets as soon as I saw them. Um, but... That hasn't happened in a while. I think it is an issue with Yahoo, I'm assuming. Or it was the places I went. Uh, they don't exist. Very good. But like, yeah. I don't know. It was happening in Copenhagen as well. I think it was just a Yahoo problem yeah. that is now getting fixed. I think there's a but, Yahoo problem. It's called Yahoo. And that is in the process of being redone to use forecast.io. Nice. Very nice. Still incomplete. So how about you, Brandon? Where can we find you? That's a good question. You can find me on the Twitter sphere at Brandon underscore MN. Uh, you can also find my website, which is now parallel with my Twitter name at Brandon dot MN. Nice. It works now. It's pretty slick. Um, and you can also find me roaming the, uh, the uh, green line between West bank and uh, stadium village for the majority of the week. I might have uh, to copy be, be your, um, your landing page here. Yeah. Uh, it looks nice. I, mean, I like it. It, it, it is, uh, it is thematic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brandon, your, your website is so simple. I love it. Mine <laughs> feels, mine feels stuck in the late nineties or, or mid two thousands and it's tab bar. I don't Maybe, know. Yeah. I also like your commented out section here in the, um, in the source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're supposed you, to have that stationary review, remember? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on Google+, Plus, which is where I post pictures of things like computer builds, computer music, dancing to LED lights, and, you know, other such things, like returning to Micro Center to replace a broken board. Mm-hmm. Hooray, Micro nice. Center. I'm, I'm disappointed that Micro Center has no A's in it, because otherwise... We could call it Bay in a like, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I tried. Fun fact in Danish, I think I told you this on Slack. Um, mm -hmm. Bay, or I don't know if Bay, 
it's with the, the AE together symbol. In Danish, yep. if you use it, that means poo. Huh. Gosh. So, like, like that? Um, poo emoji? Yep, the smiling pile of poo. <laughs> I love that emoji. That emoji is everything. Oh, you, you know, like that one too? <laughs> there are there are stores now that uh, that sell the poop emoji pillows. Uh, like I saw that at Rosedale this weekend. How am I not surprised? It's a thing. My new favorite emoji though is the upside down smiley face. Oh, it's the best! Yeah, I love it. It's <laughs> applicable in all situations. Applicable yeah. in all situations. I saw somewhere that the most popular emoji is the joy emoji with the tears <laughs> coming out. Yep. It's such a I've weird. Such a weird one to be the most popular. It's like crazy laughter. I don't know. I've been starting to use that more. And um, let's see. I'm trying to use emojis a little more because I think they're kind of fun. And then the, the crying one with the tears streaming down the face. Yeah. So you know you know Google's um, new thing for Inbox where they generate um, possible replies for you? Yeah. Have you guys heard about that? I kind of wish. I have heard about that. I kind of wish oh. um, like uh, Android or iOS would have a built-in thing that would analyze previous text you know in whatever yeah. you can see and pick emojis for you because there's so many of them now i can't figure it out oh well, totally. actually in ios 8 and and on with the autocorrect it does kind of see if you have a text say this or this it'll give you those two options or so it'll suggest but i don't think it goes as far as emoji unless that's what a lot of people use all the time and it's a yeah. response. i think that'd be pretty cool but maybe i don't know maybe if someone text me with a uh, smiley face emoji or frowny face emoji it'll let me choose one <laughs> yep yep at some point at some point we'll get there well cool well this has uh, been a great show yeah, yeah great show pretty awesome see you all in the near future probably yeah, in about a month time. <laughs> yeah in a, in a <laughs> month <laughs> yeah have a good Maybe one slightly less bye see you Thanks for listening to Podkit. For more, listen to The Fringe and listen to the next episode, too. Oh, no. Yeah, I have to imagine that right now they're like, shit, we have to wait (laughs) three years now before we can read something else.